talking earlier about, you know, one of the things you really like is tasting that first cigar coming off the rolling table. Well, you know, that cigar isn't necessarily going to be what that cigar is like six months Exactly. Ago. So how do, you, how do you tell based on what it tastes like off the rolling table versus what it's going to be like when it hits the market? Is it just experience? It's called hope. <laughs> no, 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 no. Be, be honest, though. That, that is experience. No, it, it... You have to know. It's... it's it's knowing what that tobacco can do later on and, and understanding where that where the moisture content in that cigar can can take out of that cigar. But I always smoke cigars right off the bench and then I'll smoke them two weeks later and I'll smoke them four weeks later. So you can sort of see where it's going. And I'll see where it's going. But you really get a big impression off the bench. Yeah. I mean if it tastes good off the bench, you know it's gonna be phenomenal. We used to Down argue with cigar smokers all the time because I, I, I mean, uh, with, uh, with with makers because I'd say you have no idea what the consumer tastes because they smoke they smoke in the factory and they, you know they smoke cigars at a at a different age uh, at a, at a different state of their of their life and what they think of as the flavors of their cigar has very little to do with what's on the shelf in a smoke shop. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't, and it also depends on the humidor. No. That it goes into. Well, it depends on the. Um, I mean, the cigars in here could taste different than the cigars over in, in the DC store. Humidity, temperature, everything. I like to say, for the record, that's not true. Everything at W. Curtis Draper is scientific and um, a company man. So you had said that, uh, that this is the heyday at the moment, right? The blends are getting better, but everything seems to be getting better. This yeah. is the golden age of cigar smoking. Do you think that the cigar rating numbers are getting too high? That everybody's in the 90s, 95s in a couple of cases. Do you think everything's shifting, or is the blends actually getting that good? Now, what, is this a new comparison we should set? Maybe shift the numbers back down and start over? I think cigars now, honestly, are more like cigars were in the 70s. When no, you mean when in I'm terms of the blends? Show. No, the the. the just the complexity, every blend, I guess blends would come into play, but complexity, flavor profiles, I think, and quality. I mean, quality. 70s and 80s cigars were phenomenal. I mean, look at Hoyt and Nicaragua in the 70s. It was considered one of the best cigars in the world. It was the best cigar in the world because those were when, when, phenomenal. when Hoyt and Nicaragua was launched. They were the worst years Cuba had had in two decades. Phenomenal cigars. But and then it got lost. Now it's something different. It's now something different. It's it's very different tobacco too. I mean the the, the mash bill, if you will, is is totally different. But I I, I think that again, and I and I hate to uh, sort of be a one note about this, but but to a large degree, what you're referring to is uh, a consumer attitude. The, the fact is that in general in ratings, especially you know with the, now the prevalence of the 100 point rating or something that corresponds to it, people don't want to talk, because there are so many extraordinary choices that are maybe landing in that 90 and above range, they go, oh, an 88? I'm not smoking that shit. You know, it's ridiculous. It's not, and, and, and it's you, again, you have to be informed about the, the particular rating group that you're embracing because, for example, you know, back in the day in Cigar Aficionado, especially, the, the, the collective palette was definitely uh, biased towards a richer, more full-bodied, more complex cigar, and, and especially as we got into sort of the late 90s and early 2000s, there, were, there was a, 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 a big gap. In other words, there were certain cigars that hit that button, then there's an enormous number of cigars that are just below it that would, that would live in the 80s in their ratings, and then there was everything else. And, and the, the, the problem would be that you would say, oh yeah, this cigar's a 94, and another one, you know, a cigar that has a lot of things similar, you know, same country of origin, a similar sort of blend profile, and maybe a slightly different wrapper, but it would get an 89, and people go, who cares about that? You know, I want to smoke the 94. So you're numbers whores, you know? In other words, you're, you're, you're embracing only the idea. And a, the, the worst thing about sort of the phenomena of rating and how it has, and this, is, this happened in the wine industry long before it, it hit the cigar business, the worst thing is that people embrace the numbers only and not what goes along with it. And when you tell somebody something is a 94, they, they rush out. You know, we, this happened back in the day of, yeah. of the emergence of the ratings and their impact in the marketplace, which was enormous, especially early on. And guys would come rushing in and say, I've got to have this cigar. I've got a 95. And it would be like, 
dude, you smoke Macanudo, you know, this thing is going to blow the top of your head off, you know, you're, it's, it's a ridiculous, uh, you know, don't buy this, it's not for you. And a tobacconist doing his job, saying, I know you, I know what you like to smoke, I know what your history is, a 95 for you is this, it's a vintage and that that, that, that has more complexity, and the guy's like, no, 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 i got to have this. And then they'd come back and go, I didn't like that cigar, their ratings are full of shit. Well, no, because you're not, they're not, they're not embracing the, all of the information that's there in the rating process and, and, and how you got to it, and they're not looking at the body of work that represents, you know, how, how you use that information. And, and it's, again, I go back to this, it's like that with, with movies and, and with food and everything else. You, you have to know something about the people that are offering their opinions so that you can find out how it intersects with you, even if there's only this tiny little sliver in the middle where your Venn diagrams overlap, you know? Say, yeah, okay, yeah, this, this is the part where, where I live. This is what I like. And, and, and that only comes through in, you know, two or three lines that, that accompany a number. And as long as all you're doing is saying, uh, you know, this number is, 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 is my guideline, then you're missing half of the story and you may not be happy with what you do as a result. And, <laughs> you know, like I say, we're, we're, it, the, the, the big action is always in the marketplace today is if it gets 90 or above and sells for $5, everybody in the world wants to buy it. And the minute that that happens, the manufacturer goes, oh, I got to take advantage of this. And they crank out a bunch of production which has nowhere near the time or care or attention to it. You know, maybe it doesn't even use the same blend, but it has the same band and it comes in the same package. And people go, oh, I got to buy that. And then they smoke it and go, well, it ain't all that and, 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 and a loaf of bread too. You know, forget it. This is, this is no good. The information is useless to me. Like George not evaluating. George is saying it's, it's, it's a select group of people's taste that's their their rating a 95 point cigar to you is maybe different to a 95 to me i have a lot of 95 cigars i don't really i mean but to me i should i have a 100 point cigar right but it it doesn't get rated that way it's it's all subjective as a consumer actually because the benefit of the blogging community but as you were just saying george you can find somebody who's like you know what consistently this guy it's found cigars, and once I tried them, I liked them, and I believe in his reviews. Right. Mm -hmm. When he reviews something at a 90, they could call it 88. I don't care. I like this guy. So I think that's a benefit of the bloggers, and now you have more people you can find that you can relate to which helps the industry. We have now, a wider community of people offering their opinion, and the more yeah. you have, the more you can find and embrace the one that reflects your own tastes. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, but, if, you, but again, the same thing is that, that you, if that person isn't reasonably rigorous and disciplined in the way they offer those opinions, then it can be all over the charts and you can go, hey, wait a minute, this guy let me down, you know, uh, the last time he recommended a cigar I, I fell in love with it, it was the greatest thing I ever smoked, and now he's using the same language about this cigar and I hate it, you know, I want to use a tongue scraper when I'm through smoking it, okay, then, then, then you, you know, immediately, it's a, it, this is a big conflict. And if you, if you are not reasonably confident about the process, that a blogger or any reviewer uses to evaluate a product, then the information that you're getting is suspect at best. Right. And you have to, you know, you, you form a relationship. You know, the, over a period of time you've been reading the reviews, like you said, you found somebody who has an opinion that, that consistently melds with yours, that's the person you're going to believe in. And, and the fact that there is a method for them to get that opinion out to an enormous audience is a great boon to everybody in the business. In other words, the fact that you can reasonably publish and expect a very big audience to have access to that information as opposed to you got to have enough money to pay a printer and, and, and know how to get it through the circulation process. So that, you know, the democracy of the, of the dissemination of information is a great thing, but with that, you know, comes a certain amount of responsibility. And only the consumers can impose that. Only the consumers can call bullshit on the guy that, 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 that betrayed their trust. I think uh, coming from my side of the business, and I'm a distributor more than I am a manufacturer, but manufacturers, it's nice to see multiple people rate the same cigar almost at the same level. When you start seeing variables, then you, you start questioning whether or not they really know what they're talking about. Yeah, in other words, like if Jerry rates it a 92, that, that or Steven rates it a 94, right. and then Cigar Aficionado rates it an 88, I start questioning whether or not Cigar Aficionado is really tasting it the right way. It's, it's all subjective. It's nice to see more consistent ratings when, when you 
if I bring out a new cigar and everybody rates it 91 to 93, it's great. And if you look at the wine industry, I mean, there's a reason why there's certain guys that have certain palates that taste wine. And people poo-poo suckling all the time, but you look at suckling and you look at Parker, and their ratings are almost identical. You see a, a Chateau in, in France, and they're both giving it 95 to 97 or 96, and they're in that same range. But the reason... I'd, I'd be hard to say that a guy like Jerry will drink the same wine and say it's an 88. But the reason that, that, that those guys get there, don't forget that, that Parker and Suckling have a lot of the same background in the experience of what they know. Yeah. You know, in other words, their base is Bordeaux, and in Suckling's case, mm -hmm. a little more port, you know, but, but their, their, their knowledge runs along the same tracks. So it's logical that with the amount, well, you know, the other thing that, that, that sort of gets lost is once, you, once you've been in a position for an extended period of time as an evaluator, as a, as a, as a rater of products with an opinion that, that moves the needle in the marketplace and people start giving you, giving you product, you know, the variety of things that you have tasted, the amount of material that you have ingested for, uh, for the purposes of regurgitating an opinion mm -hmm. is extraordinary. And the vast majority of consumers that you are reaching do not have that same level of experience. No, they're, they're so, smoking one cigar and giving an opinion on one cigar, well, not, but, but, not but, five or ten. But they don't <laughs> smoke, for professional evaluation purposes, 3,000 cigars a year. Yeah. Where they where they apply that they don't drink you know five thousand wines and in, you know in in the wine business especially now you have a lot more compartmentalization you know uh, uh, where you have a guy who's a who's an, an acknowledged Bordeaux expert a guy like Suckling who's the living world's leaving authority on port mm -hmm. right and 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 then you have Bruce Sanderson who's the greatest guy in the world when it comes to Alsace okay and that's where they live that's what they're doing. In the cigar business, it's much more scattershot. In other words, everything is coming in, and they're evaluating Dominican, Honduran, Nicaraguan, uh, Miami, mm -hmm. uh, Cuba, you know, and and they're uh, they can be rendering an opinion about something that they really don't have enough experience to uh, uh, professionally evaluate in its context. No, true. In in its context of offering, when we first there's an rating, idea for all your bloggers. You might yeah. want to become an only Nicaraguan do, blogger. Do, uh, 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 learn learn more about one particular area and become a, look at David Kitchens look no, at David absolutely. Kitchens there's a, there's a, a guy Dominican guy this, he's, exactly he is David can is, look at Dominican cigars pick it up and pick apart a blend in two seconds mm -hmm. every he year he a Nicaraguan cigar and put a gun to his head no, yeah. forget it but he'll know exactly what goes in that Dominican cigar and that's absolutely. really how I was with Cuba when I grew up when I was growing up in the industry I studied cigars to where I could pick apart a, a Cuban cigar and know exactly what you were looking at. What I was looking at, but also know that that cigar that's supposedly Cuban isn't a Cuban. Right. He takes it even a step farther to know that it wasn't supposed to be that cigar in Cuba, that it was rolled in the wrong factory. I mean, he, he's a little anomaly, you know? <laughs> freak, I think. This a guy's a freak. freak. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> no, it's... It, so, but that might be a good idea. It really be a good idea to see some bloggers concentrate on certain countries. This only. is our discipline. This is our discipline. This is what we know. We've been there. We've be seen a specialist. The farms. Exactly. Be a specialist. Because, you might be a cigar specialist, but because your opinion be a then specialist has, of a certain region. But your opinion then has more authority. Yeah. Exactly. It has more authority. You're bringing more to it, and that's something that a consumer can embrace. They see, go, right this there. Guy George really just gave all you guys an idea. If you want to be the leading authority on a certain product, Pick a country mm -hmm. and be that guy. And next thing you know, people are going to start looking at you as the leading guy. That's exactly right. And you'll be, you'll, you'll literally be uh, an authority and something, your voice has more gravitas. People, mm -hmm. people respect your opinion. It has more currency in the marketplace. Everybody's, you, you, the, the, the entire process. I see process Charlie's head already spinning. He's, already, he's like, <laughs> but, pick, pick but Nicaragua, pick Nicaragua. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it's it's genuinely it's 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 logical and uh, and it and it has uh, it has benefits for everybody involved in the process. Absolutely, absolutely. A, I love that part. Oh, that's great. That's I think that was the best part of the whole interview. <laughs> it, well, if it takes seed and somebody runs with it, it has a uh, it, it 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 has value. See, I was the guy in Los Angeles that everybody would come to to tell them whether or not they had real? a real Cuban or a fake Cuban. I was that guy. And it was because of what I learned from him. But 
get to smoke them out of it, right? I got to smoke a lot of it. Well, most of the time, I, I actually got to smoke them, but a big portion of the time, I was sniffing the cigar up my nostril like Jeannie thought it was weird. I was looking at the construction, looking at the wrapper, and telling them, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you can look at the construction, you, you know, even today. You can look at the construction, pretty much you can tell what factory it came from. Yeah, well, not so much anymore, but maybe you. <laughs> I kind of lost that art. But that's it. I mean, they they all have a footprint, and there's a there's a there's a particular technique, and you know, it's it's not about looking at a box or a, a band or you know any printing stuff. It's about what does the tobacco say to you? Yeah, yeah. And honestly, really, that's part of really what the evaluation process for a cigar should be. It should be not what's the story, what has the manufacturer told me, how does it look, is this the coolest band I've ever seen? It should be just. What what is the tobacco telling you? What what are you you know? Is it can can you tell right away that it's young or has it had some age? Was this uh, 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 you know a, a product from a guy that really knows fermentation and blending? And and then you know what was my experience? What what happened? How did did the cigar tell me a story? Did I go on a journey or was it just this thing and I burned it and that's the end of it? You know it did, it didn't destroy my tongue and uh, you know nobody threw me out of the room because it stunk. So gee, it must be a good cigar. That's ninety points. <laughs> Have we worn you guys out? He wore the camera out, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> What do you qualify as the beginning of the boom? Uh, well, speaker and I graduated high school in 81, so mm -hmm. <laughs> then he started smoking cigars until about seven, eight years ago. So before me, mm -hmm. uh, there was a negative aspect of Maduro's where they would spray it, and, and then that caused some issues. With Somehow people. alter the color. Yeah, yeah, and, and so that kind of had a negative impact on Maduro. Do you still see that negativity happening where people, you were talking earlier about people romancing the technology that's really very similar. No, I'll say there's there's people that, that cheat on coloring wrappers and then you gotta remember Maduro is is a is a color. More than it is a process. A process. It's a color. Okay, that I didn't know. If you have I mean if you naturally ferment tobacco and it comes out dark, it's Maduro. And that's how it should be. But there's been a lot of things over the years where you start seeing people altering the colors of a wrapper to make sure they always look dark and always look shiny and always look, you know, oily. There aren't too many cigars in the marketplace anymore that make your fingers sticky like Coca-Cola, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've gotten, that. that's a, a really an advantage of, of the things that have happened, that, that you know, you're, you're not seeing a lot of uh, artificially manipulated. No, product. I mean, I think the, con the consumers... Well, actually, I can't say all consumers, but a good portion of, of heavy-duty smokers that can understand when a, when a cigar's been altered, tainted, uh, colored, greased up. Well, that, that, so now you, you, you just hit on something that I think is very interesting. What, what percentage of the, of, the, of the buying market for premium cigars do you think are now, you know, reasonably well educated, you know, into the aficionado uh, category as opposed to the guys that walk in, you know, that are maybe five percent. Yeah. Maybe five percent. But it's but compare that to, to pre nineteen. Because there's still a lot of guys like George said would walk in a store and give me something big and fat. Yeah. Then there's actually people that, that rom you know, they romance it themselves and they wanna they wanna understand everything they're doing. It's like people who get into fine wines or, or whiskies. They study the art of it, and they study the, the product, and they, they, they want to learn more about it. I mean, that's, that's a different animal, though. I mean, we're guys, everybody sitting in this room is a different breed of a cigar smoker. I mean, a, a normal cigar wanted, smoker that just wanted the big, fat cigar is going to run up to the register and walk out of here. He's not going to even care about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's simple. Maybe 5%, and that's a high. Away from the negative, go to the positive. Um, a new method of rolling. There's two or three major methods of rolling. What's there some new innovations coming that you think are going to be cool coming in the next couple of years? 
Little Monsters, available soon from Dan Prince <laughs> No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that, that you can really, honestly, I don't think you can really reinvent this. Yeah. It's, it's an art that's been done forever. You can't just say, hey, I got a better idea. I have an, an opinion on how things should be done, but is my idea better than anybody else's? I don't think so. Well, look at some of the innovations that have come out, I mean, different shapes that maybe in the past 20, 30 years, they're new to us, but maybe they existed 100 years ago. I can tell you the triangle version cigar didn't work. <laughs> no, yeah. No, but there, there, there's, a, there's a, a vast catalog of experience that's that, that to, a, to a degree today is being strip mined for what are uh, peddled as new ideas. Uh, but you know, I mean, we're, you're you're in a country where uh, uh, there used to be, at, even within a, a radius of here, dozens of cigar of tobacco manufacturers. There were there were thousands in Pennsylvania. There were there were, you know, ten thousand registered in New York City. A uh, hundred years ago, the catalogs. The, the the truth is that the 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 business of uh, you know manufacturing and distribution has done this. It's come down. There are there are far fewer points. There 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 are fewer manufacturers. There are you know uh, fewer really popular sizes. Um, it, it 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 it's been a distillation process, and to a large degree, a lot of the things that have happened in the last twenty years have been refinements, you know, they've been pressures on skills, so, so cigar making is not as sloppy as it once was. Um, there's a, there's a, a tremendous amount of sophistication in terms of uh, control of fermentation and then how tobacco is, uh, first of all, how it's sorted and how, it, how it's literally how it's fermented and then, then how it's put in a barn to age and, and what gets used. So that, that, those things Again, that, to my way of thinking, is the defense of the of the change in pricing yeah. that that the boom there's more time, uh, caused. More care. There's 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 money to 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 make significant differences in how tobacco gets handled. Well, I'll tell you that there's a funny story. Uh, Gustavo Cura from uh, Oliva Tobacco, not to be confused with Oliva Cigar. Oliva cigars. Different family, no relation. I was uh, with a group in Nicaragua, and Gustavo gave us a tour, and he said. Uh, he had to give a lot of props to Pepin. And Pepin's old school Cuba. He's a Wajiro. I mean, he's a, he's a farmer, he, but he's old school. He understands tobacco. He grew up in it. And I'm proud to say he's one of the few guys that owns a company that can actually sit down and roll a cigar. Right. There's not many. Actually, very little. Very few. And that, that's, you're talking about a whole family, including their daughter, Yanni, that can roll, roll a cigar. It's impressive. But Gustavo said, you know, I got to get Pepin props because he's the only guy that can come in here and self-sort a pilon, do spot checks on a pilon and say, okay, that's mine. Before it's done fermenting, before the process is final, he goes through and, and spot checks pilons and says, okay, it's mine. He said that he makes a lot more percentage value, percentage dollars off of Pepin because Pepin does it before all these hands touch the tobacco. Yeah than he does with all the other guys that are waiting for Oliva Tobacco to sort the tobacco. He might sell it at a higher price point to those guys, but he's lost six months of a lot of hands touching that tobacco, and he has to sell it to them for, let's say, $27 a pound, and Pepin's buying it for 22 He made more off the $22 than he made off the 27 It takes a lot of money and a lot of time and the care yeah. of sorting tobacco, like George was saying, that, that where it adds that dollar value. Seed varietals, another thing, like Pelo de Oro. Yeah. But being joked that if everything was made with Pelo de Oro, everything would be $20. When you're getting 10 leaves a, a plant, and you're only get, able to plant like one hectare, or one manzana, or two yeah. manzanas worth of tobacco, and you're trying to use that to make all your production, I'm sorry, but yeah, everything's gonna be at least $25. It, it, there's a lot more care in the sorting, like George said, but there's also a lot more care on what seed varietals they're putting into the farm and making sure that it's growing right and, and the blending and everything. It takes time. I mean, you think about it, hundreds of hands touch a tobacco plant before we even smoke a cigar. So It's extraordinary that you can buy it for yeah. 8 10 $12. There's a reason why an iPad's eight hundred and seventy-five dollars, <laughs> whatever it is now. 
Well, that's marketing, right? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think cigars, just the care. I think Cuba had that care a long time ago. Yeah. But I because think they, they had fierce pride. Absolutely. Because they had fierce pride. That's in, the one thing about was. Cubans, man. They're very proud of what they do. But uh, and even the Cuban people that roll cigars in the factories, you saw a big change in the way they they rolled cigars, where a lot of older rollers left the factories because they they didn't understand how how the people wanted to make the cigars. They changed the way they bunched cigars. Yeah. The younger rollers would come in, and it was like the old guys were like, "This isn't how you roll cigars," and they left. There's there's a distinct difference between how Cuba does stuff now compared to how they used to. And I'll tell you that the one big difference is now it's a big giant money machine for one guy. You see a lot of these companies outside of Cuba that are rolling better cigars than Cuba could ever roll now. But they would never even compare into what they rolled back in the 60s and 70s. And even the 80s. Even the 80s. Early 90s even. Come the boom where everybody wanted a, a Cuban cigar, that's when you saw counterfeits. And well, counterfeits explode, sloppy. and the production, you know, Cuba triples production, and, uh, uh, you know, the skill level uh, of the factories drops, pressure on, uh, on, on them to get tobacco through the barns and, and into the factories. A lot of, a lot of different factors contributed to um, the decline. I, you know, I mean, not, we don't want to engage in, in bashing the output of a, an entire country because they're... There are still no. There's still people down there. First of all, that, there's still that, extraordinary raw material it, it, to some degree, and they they still make a, 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 some of the greatest cigars in the world in in diminishing numbers. You know the thing is, we, you you have to consider scale. Uh, uh, you know that you can take a couple of factories in the Dominican Republic these days, and they export more cigars than Cuba's national production. Yeah. For export. Yeah. You know, forget what they make for the for the domestic market. So. Um, if you, and that's one of the things that's always been a, a, a sort of a, a wild card in the in the issue of evaluating Cuban cigars. If they have an extraordinary yield, uh, there's always going to be a, a, a percentage of tobacco that comes across the top that goes into making, you know, nowadays Cohiba and Trinidad and the things that that we know as Edición Limitadas and Edición Regionales. And they have uh, they have an extraordinary pedigree that does not apply to the rest of the cigars in that pyramid that all used to be iconic. Mm -hmm. So the same standards of control of the tobacco and of the manufacturing don't apply to Monte Cristo Number no. Two, uh, a Romeo Churchill, uh, Hoyo Epicure Number no. Two that used to be. In other words, the, yeah, the, 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 12, the 12 iconic, uh, you know, to, to, just to pick a number out of the air, but figured, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 cigars sort of defined the industry. And they're the things that, you know, you fell in love with a long time ago that, 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 that taught you lessons about what a great cigar can be. And the same rigor does not apply in the factory in producing them today. No. You, have to, you have to spend 30% more to get a much more rarefied, you know, there used to be a time where you could pick up a, a Series D and know that it was a Series D. Yeah. There used to be a time where it was an Epicure number two and know it was Epicure number two. But now the, the blend But now it's all the same. A, 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 an Epicure number two and, and a... Uh, uh, and I'll call this one out. To all you cigar smokers out there, if you think you're going to get a better cigar in five years from a cigar that you bought from Cuba today because you think that it's going to gracefully age in the box, I'm sorry, but it will never do anything but be green. If it starts green, it will remain green, and that's it. If it's badly fermented and poorly made, all you're going to get is an old, badly fermented, poorly made <laughs> Exactly. And will not improve. That's frustrating. I had a guy in uh, Germany, a Habanos dealer. I smoked a new Sancho Panza for, for Germany, which was... Not what Sancho Panza is, by the way. Well, but Sancho has not been itself for a no, long time. No, for a long time. But it was it was a horrible Sancho Panza, or whatever it might have been. Yeah. And he actually told me, he says, I usually tell my clients to wait four years before they smoke them. I'm like, I'm sorry, but in four years, it's still going to be shitty. But you know, though, that touches on something that is uh, a little bit different in our marketplace especially, and that, to a degree, is... Uh, um, an American um, desire, and it and it applies. It's changed the wine business too. 
you know, both mm-hmm. in terms of the winemaking styles and of of the of the design. We want things now. It, yeah, yeah. It, it used to be that you went to your tobacconist and said, you know, I, I, give me ten boxes of cigars that I can lay down, and then give me another two that I can smoke. Okay, but like with cigars, I know that if I smoke one of my cigars that is good, mm-hmm. I know I can sit it down for five years and it's going to be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, a good test is like the WCD 120, yeah. the original one. When it first came out, it was great, and if you taste it now, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. If you taste a 125, it's a, it's a good start to what that cigar was five years it's ago. It's a cigar with great bones that has extraordinary potential. You have to have the bones. But but there but there That's are a lot the of cigars that wine. are made. But there are a lot of cigars today that are not made to do that. There are a lot of cigars that are absolutely not made to be the thing that you can park in your humidor no. and come back to. No, yeah, I agree with that. There are certain cigars that are, are ready to smoke right out the gate. I stick more to the traditional side where I make cigars that are. Age good worthy. outside the box, but age worthy. Age worthy. I want to have a, I want to be able to drink a, a nice bottle of Bordeaux and realize that hey, you know what? Five years from now, it's going to be phenomenal. Ten years from now, it's going to even be better. But there are certain cigars and producers that do very good cigars, great cigars, and tr- considered some of the best cigars in the market that are made to be smoked now because they process their tobacco so much that it's made to be easy on the palate with great flavor, but if you try to age it, it dies off. It, it loses. It, it, it starts down the downhill track right away. And that's kind of where we go with the La Verte. Probably fermented tobacco. Good bones. Yeah, La Verte... Smokes young, but when I say young, it's not green. It smokes young. But it's you a cigar see the potential. Exactly. It, it's a cigar that, that, that is meant to reward your investment in time. Exactly. And there should be more like that. And, and, and if he anything, always says stuff better than I do. <laughs> if, if if there's anything that positive that could come out of the entire project, it would be that more manufacturers would emulate that, even if it's only with a percentage of their production to say, okay, here's a cigar that's age worthy. Yeah. Buy this, enjoy it now if you like, but recognize that you're you're. The potential satisfaction of a year, two years, three years down the road is that much greater. And, yeah, yeah. and if you can just wait, and, and you know, that's no, I, I smoked uh, a Juan Lopez that the uh, cigar aficionado was rating. And they rated it really high. Yeah. So I wanted to try it, and uh, I got I got a hold of one of them from from one of the guys, and I smoked it. I was like, holy shit! Like this is this is not what I'm think about some Cuban cigars nowadays yeah. that are green tobacco, young, under fermented. This actually had potential. I realized, wow, I understood why they rated it the way they do. And you could see, like, okay, that's the box I'm going to sit down. That's the box that I want to age. But go back to Cuba with the whole thing is like it's few and far between with the Cuban cigars. It's not. It's not there all the time. You, and there's no. There's no longer something that you can hang your uh, your tag on and say, yes, this is the thing. Uh, it, it, it's this is made for for that process. This is made to mature. Um, the 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 integrity of the brands and the particular shapes is gone. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't have it's 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 all over the reservation in terms of you know you're you were lucky to find something that you think okay this is great I'm going to buy it but if you tried to make that same decision on that same cigar that same size six months from now you could be really really disappointed. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that is the difference between a lot of the product that's in our marketplace today. Remember the 25 year old uh, Poros Indios? Yeah. They were smoking like a dream. Yeah. Sitting in a basement yeah. in Union City, New Jersey. Exactly. I, I first had them when they were 17 years old. Amazing cigars. Way he's before a, their time. He's a he's a guy that Rolando Senior in particular Rolando Senior doesn't get the credit that he deserves for uh, the cigars that he made and the approach that he took, both in terms of the tobacco that he used. The, the kind of blend formula to produce a cigar with that kind of character that would be that age worthy and the figurados, the shapes that he no, used to uh, he make. Actually, he actually, was pretty, yeah, he was pretty innovative with his shapes. I don't know if you remember this story, but uh, George gave me a, uh, actually, I had been down in the basement in Union City and George made a phone call to our friend that was with Poros Inus at the time and said, uh, whatever you do, don't let him, don't let him go down to the basement. Yeah. So, of course, I asked what was in the basement. Next thing you know, I'm getting these old aliados, old poros indios, 
fast forward five years, I think it was, mm -hmm. George had known a, uh, a chef at the Grand Havana Room, and I was looking for a new, uh, a new employee at the Grand Havana Room in New York. And the chef came out and said, uh, this is a cigar from George. He wants, me to, he wants you to tell him what it is. So I looked at it, and I sniffed it, and trained by him because how to study a cigar. And this is where I learned it from. I looked at it, sniffed it, cut it, put it in my mouth, didn't light it. And I looked at the guy and said, this is from the basement in Union City, New Jersey. <laughs> and he's like, and the how, chef, the how the hell did fuck you know, do you know that? that? That was your Romeo Casadori moment. I know. Uh, <laughs> that was actually. Yeah. I, used to try to, I used to try to fool him. Never happened. I used to bring him cigars that looked unbelievable unbelievable and uncharacteristic of what the cigars were. And he would cut it, not even smoke it, put it in his mouth. He goes, so Romeo Casadori. I'm like, how would you know that? Study, time. Wasted knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And those, but that. But that's I mean, when cigars were different. That, but that's that philosophy doesn't really exist anymore because, by the way, even those guys got corrupted in terms of, of what they were doing. There's nobody. I mean, to, but it should it should because if you if even in the factory, yeah. With that I work with, I know that my cigars are going to taste different than Bavina Jaime's. Mm -hmm. It's simple. We both, we all of us have different. Palettes. Thank we, God. We we taste different things in cigars, and like when Jaime Pepin made a cigar for another company, I lit it up and I was like, "Who made this blend?" Like, yeah. I'm like, "Did did you did did you choose it for them or did they pick it?" And they're like, "No, they picked it." I'm like, "It's a horrible cigar. It's just what I tasted." Mm -hmm. But I know I can go into that factory and and have you can use the same cigars. material. You can use the same material and come up with a completely different result. No, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, but that's how Cuban cigars were. You could taste those differences yeah. and understand this is this and this is that and this is that. It's, it's different now. I mean, I would love to give people cigars blind and, and say, okay, Pete, that's a Triumphador. That's a Coho Nu. I would love for them to, to absolutely know that. To Without know, having bands on, to recognize the singularity of your blends and the consistency, you know that 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 over a period of time you've achieved that people have that much identification. No, I had a guy in the factory give me a, a cigar one day. A consumer was down mm -hmm. on a trip in Nicaragua and gave me a cigar and says, "What do you think?" I lit it up. I'm like, "It tastes like something I make." And he goes, "Well, it kind of is because I." took your cigar and I put a Cuban wrapper on it. <laughs> nice. It's just, it's from learning from guys like him, from Carlio Fuente, I mean from everybody I learned in the business. It, I studied it. I said, this industry is a teaching machine. You just have to look for the information. It's nice. Well, hopefully um, there will be enough young guys inspired, uh, in particular by successes like yours, to follow in your footsteps and to come to you for advice because ah, I hope so yeah I uh, I mean you look at like a guy like Dion who is very picky and very knowledgeable about what he's doing but he learned from Hanky so he's got a certain school that he learned from and he studies that philosophy yeah. very heavily I learned I didn't get I didn't get to go down to Hanky's factory and watch Hanky do stuff like he does with the individual tobaccos and yeah. I learned on, on understanding cigars, how they were separately finished, and understanding what cigars, you know, finished product, and having guys like him teach me how to notice differences. And now that I get to work in a factory, that I get to do pretty much anything I want to what do. What you want to do. It's nice to know what the basis of all the blends that, that we started with so I can actually pick off of them and, and figure out the flaws that I might have in certain blends already. You can identify the components and what their contribution to the blend is. I told the Garcias the other day, I thought the, the La Riqueza, for me, at this point in time, there's a flaw in it. Every once in a while I get a good one, but every once in a while I taste something I just don't like and I want to pick it apart. But to be able to know all those components and figure out where, where I'm having a problem with it, 
And that's how like brands like Triumphador came about. Mm -hmm. I found a flaw in a certain blend, and I changed it to where I liked it, to my palate. But it only works in certain sizes, too. Yeah, you know, in other words, the, 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 the collection of Vitolas is reflective of what that tobacco can do. Yeah, absolutely. Bravo. Nice, bro. It was great. Appreciate the time. Hmm. That's it. Shows Thank over. Get the fuck out. I love this shit. I mean, most people know me in the room, but you know I could do this all day. So. You guys think that makes you feel like a uh, What was that? Come on. Thank that shit. That's what we're here what for. What a reward, exactly. That's, what do you What do you think? That was our mission in life. And I'll watch it again. And I'll watch it again. Hey, Thank you for uh, answering the questions. I appreciate that. I love learning.